Here we go. Ready? Go. Imagine you have a grievance, a really bad grievance against the government. Maybe you're a Rohingya husband in Myanmar whose wife was just gang raped by security gurus and you need the ethnic cleansing to stop. Maybe you're a Venezuelan mother who can't feed her kids because the president has enacted cruel economic policies and barred opposition candidates from contesting them. Maybe you're a homeless child in Bahrain because your family comes from the oppressed Shia majority. Maybe the British government is after you because you're an unrepentant right-wing extremist who doesn't think Muslims belong. Or maybe you're a Sunni engineer living in Nice or Orlando or Sydney or Dhaka yearning for a caliphate. Whatever your grievance, real or imagined, respectable or repugnant, it exceeds your capacity to redress it. After all, if you and your crew were stronger, you wouldn't be opposing the government. With any luck, you'd be meeting them. Not surprisingly, then, the history of the agreement is a story of failure. But not always. I've just published a book showing how aggrieved groups can overcome this power asymmetry against the government to achieve their political demands. My title, Rules for Rebels, is inspired by Saul Alinsky's classic, Rules for Radicals. In his 1971 primer for the have-nots, the father of modern community organizing shared lessons he had learned over the years for successful protests. But the problem with rules for radicals is that protesters often conclude that protesting isn't enough. Historically, many groups have escalated to violence after nonviolence failed. Michael Collins, for example, concluded in the early 20th century that the Brits would continue to ignore his pleas for Irish independence unless the revolutionaries escalated with violence. Menachem Begin and other Zionist leaders reached the same conclusion in the 1940s that the Brits would continue to occupy Palestine unless the Yishuv turned to violence. Algerian nationalists said essentially the same thing in the 1950s, that they too turned to violence only after the French had ignored their protests to end the occupation. In the 1960s, South African activists like Nelson Mandela also prescribed violence after concluding that his protests alone weren't about to end the apartheid. More recently, accounts of <coughs> Syrian rebels suggest many of them also picked up weapons as a last resort. The truth is that, like it or not, some radicals will become rebels, and there are rules for them too. Rules for Rebels starts where Rules for Radicals ends. It analyzes hundreds of militant groups from all over the world to discern why some succeed and others fail. I come with welcome news for the rebel leader. My research reveals he possesses a surprising amount of agency over his political destiny. Triumph is possible, but only for those who know what to do. It turns out there's a science to victory in militant history, but even rebels must follow rules. My rules for rebels may seem counterintuitive, but they're based on original insights from many academic disciplines, especially political science, psychology, criminology, economics, management, marketing, communications, and sociology, and then tested with a bunch of different methodological approaches from detailed qualitative case studies, to large-end regression analysis, to content analysis, to network analysis, even some survey experiments. The key takeaway is that smart militant leaders aren't always successful, but successful leaders must be smart. Islamic State may come to mind when you think of a successful militant group led by a smart leader. Clad in black robes, ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi ascended the pulpit of the Great al Nuri Mosque in the Iraqi city of Mosul on July 5, 2014, proclaiming the emergence of a new caliphate. In his Friday sermon, 
the self-professed caliph announced to the Ummah that his foot soldiers had just succeeded in capturing swaths of land in Iraq and Syria, effectively creating an Islamic state. By year's end, ISIS would control a third of Iraq and Syria, land mass roughly equal to the size of Great Britain, where the terrorists ruled over nine million people. The Islamic State was bolstered by the largest influx of international jihadis in history. Over 40,000 foreign fighters from 110 countries headed to Syria and Iraq, more than four times the number of Mujahideen who had traveled to Afghanistan in the 80s to battle the Red Army. ISIS's reach was hardly limited to the caliphate. Scores of ISIS attacks in dozens of countries terrorized the world. By 2016, Baghdadi had accepted the allegiance of 43 terrorist group affiliates, from Boko Haram in Nigeria to Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines. Now they were all fighting under the Black Banner. Not only did ISIS have territory and fighters, but it raked in over a billion dollars a year in oil sales, taxes, smuggling, looting, and hostage taking. The international media was quick to crown Islamic State leaders as masterminds. In a story entitled Military Skill and Terrorist Technique Fuel Success of ISIS, the New York Times gushed that the group's battlefield successes are due to the pedigree of its leadership. The story concluded, these guys know the terrorism business inside and out. The Guardian also credited ISIS's apparent feats to highly intelligent leaders calling the shots. The Financial Times proclaimed that ISIS is chillingly smart. If ever there were a smart, strategic, militant group, Islamic State was apparently it. This conventional wisdom in the media was fueled by think tank pundits, who proclaimed ISIS leaders as strategic geniuses in three main ways. First, ISIS leaders were allegedly smart to recognize the strategic value of brutalizing civilians, not only in its stronghold of Iraq and Syria, but in indiscriminate massacres around the world. In a Politico article entitled, How ISIS Out-Terrorized Bin Laden, <clears throat> Will McCants of the Brookings Institute explained that ISIS has been remarkably successful at recruiting fighters, capturing land, subduing its subjects, and creating a state. Why? Because violence and gore work. We're told that this terrifying approach to state building has an impressive track record. His Brookings homie, Shadi Hamid, shared this assessment in a book and countless media interviews that the shooting rampage at the Badakhlan Theater and the bombing of the Russian passenger jet over the Sinai were, as he put it, smart moves because supposedly instilling terror in the hearts of your opponents undermines their morale making them more likely to stand down, flee, or surrender, and the willingness to inflict terrible violence has a deterrent effect, raising the cost for anyone who so much as thinks of challenging the group. In their bestseller on ISIS, Michael Weiss and Hassan Hassan repeat that the group's notorious brutality helped it. In countless media interviews, they said that the head chopping and cage burning of hapless victims follows a brutal logic, and indeed showcases the evil genius of ISIS. Clearly, pundits have been impressed with how the ISIS leadership sanctions a policy of unbridled barbarism. Second, pundits commended how the ISIS leadership generated so much bloodletting, largely by decentralizing the organization. The ISIS leadership takes a hands-off approach, beckoning fanatics across the globe to butcher people of their choosing in the group's name. According to Clint Watts of the Foreign Policy, or of, uh, yeah, the Foreign Policy Research Institute, the key to ISIS's gains is that the leadership recognizes the benefits of diffuse operational control, which grants extremists the autonomy to plot and plan locally. Peter Bergen of the New America Foundation also credited the apparent success of ISIS to its diffuse organizational structure. What empowers ISIS, he wrote for CNN.com, is it accepts all comers, encouraging fanatics across the globe to carry out attacks anywhere they'd like. The brilliance of the ISIS system 
echoed MSNBC terrorism commentator Malcolm Nance, is that its recruitment system is almost passive. Baghdadi invites every nutcase to the global massacre. Baghdadi welcomes them all. The leaders could never have inflicted so much carnage on their own, but they were allegedly wise enough to expand the bloodbath by decentralizing ISIS operations and recruitment. Third, pundits applauded the ISIS strategy of broadcasting its misdeeds in lurid detail over social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. ISIS has used social media to showcase its innovative sentencing style, from beheadings with a knife, to decapitation through explosive detonation cord, to death by dragging, drowning, stoning, burial, roof chucking, squashing, sometimes with a tent. Philip Smythe of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy affirms that ISIS succeeded by cultivating the perfect sociopathic image. Charlie Winter and Colin Clark of RAND agree that Islamic State's propaganda has been unmatched, not only in terms of its quantity, or not only in terms of uh, its quality, but in its quantity too. Charles Lister of the Middle East Institute says that these jihadists in particular proved especially adept at managing their use of social media and the production of qualitatively superior video and imagery output. And yet, Something unforeseen by these terrorism talking heads happened. ISIS's beloved caliphate died just as quickly as it had appeared. Think tank pundits had been too busy glorifying the group's strategy to realize it was a bust. The green in this map is where ISIS lost territory, and the red is where ISIS held on to territory. Though, of course, even these slices are now basically gone. In fact, the caliphate got smaller every year until it all but vanished. In 2015, ISIS lost 40% of Iraq and 20% of Syria. In 2016, ISIS lost another quarter of its land. By spring 2017, ISIS controlled less than 7% of Iraq and was getting vanquished in Syria by the Syrian Arab army, its Shia militia partners, American and Russian air power, Kurdish warriors, and a smattering of other militants called the SDF. Tellingly, in June 2017, ISIS blew up the Al-Nuri Mosque, the very site where the caliphate had been declared. A few weeks later, from the ruins of Al-Nuri, the Iraqi military spokesman faced no ISIS opposition whatsoever when he declared their fictitious state had fallen. Even the fanboys in pro-ISIS chat rooms conceded the caliphate project was a complete failure. Although ISIS's raison d'etre of an Islamic state went up in smoke, there was a clear winner, its arch enemies. The Salafists repeatedly said that ISIS was intended to curb the influence of Iran and its Shia proxies, especially Hezbollah. But instead of becoming the seat of a hardline Sunni state, Iraq and Syria turned into Shia country. The Islamic State project faceplanted by its very own standard. The terrorists were, as Trump once called them, evil losers. But who could have predicted this stunning reversal of fortune? Well, I did, from day one. If, if you had the misfortune of following me on Twitter, you'd know that I was always a fierce skeptic of the ISIS conventional wisdom. From the moment Baghdadi declared a caliphate in 2014, I gave hundreds of media interviews from the Associated Press to the BBC, pointing out the basic analytical problem. The very behaviors lauded by pundits as strategic have historically doomed militant groups. ISIS, I charge, would be no exception. With a little historical context and methods training, it was obvious to me Baghdadi was no mastermind, and neither were his fellow strategists. They were, as you'll see, supremely stupid terrorists. President Obama got hammered in the media for saying early on that ISIS was the JV team of terrorists, but he was right, at least when it comes to their cluelessness about devising a winning political strategy. Smart militant leaders follow three simple rules for victory, the exact opposite of what ISIS leaders have done. First, smart leaders recognize that not all violence is equal for achieving their stated political goals. 
In fact, they grasp that some attacks should be carefully avoided because they're deeply counterproductive for the cause. My research is the first to empirically demonstrate that there is variation in the political utility of attacks depending on the target. Compared to more selective violence against military and other government targets, indiscriminate violence against civilian targets is counterproductive. So the first thing that smart militant leaders do is recognize that civilian attacks are a recipe for political failure. You might say that the first rule for rebels is for the leader to learn not to use terrorism at all. There's no consensus over the definition of terrorism, but most scholars define it as attacks against civilian targets in particular. When we talk about terrorism, we mean civilian attacks, like against schools, markets, uh, shopping centers, commercial airplanes, synagogues, churches, mosques, we're not talking about blowing the treads off of a tank. What matters for the rebel leader, though, isn't how we define terrorism, but that he understands the folly of harming civilians. Leaders may not initially grasp the risk of terrorism, but the smart ones learn it over time. Without internalizing this rule, they can't be expected to follow the other ones and prevail. The second rule is for the leader to actively restrain lower level members from committing terrorism. It doesn't matter whether the leader understands the futility of terrorism if his members continue to do it. The key is for the leader to structure the organization to restrain his fighters from harming civilians. In practice, this means centralizing the organization so we can educate fighters to avoid civilians, discipline fighters who harm civilians, and vet out prospective members who seem prone to harming civilians. Whereas the first rule is for the leader to recognize the value of civilian restraint, the second rule is for getting his members to abide. And the third rule is what to do when they don't. For the rebel leader, the key is to make the group look moderate, even when his members act otherwise. This means protecting the brand by denying organizational involvement, or at least intent, whenever wayward operatives harm civilians. These three simple rules for rebels, learning to win, restraining to win, and denying to win, are the secrets for victory. Long before ISIS inverted this playbook, smart militant leaders were following it. They're the ones nodding their heads from parliaments, not spikes. What I'd like to do in the remainder of this talk is walk you through some of the multi-method evidence behind each rule. Feel free to ask me questions about my argument or evidence in the Q&A because I'd like to breeze through a lot of material pretty quickly now. I began to question the strategic value of terrorism as early as 2004 when I headed to the West Bank to do some field research during the second Antifada. This was the height of Palestinian terrorism, and Israel was in the process of building up a massive security barrier to prevent suicide bombers from crossing into pre-1967 territory. I spent this three-month trip talking to Israelis and Palestinians. The Israelis told me that the fence, as they call it, wasn't a new idea. It had been bandied about for ages. What changed was that most Israelis had given up hope that the Palestinians could ever be trusted as a partner for peace. Polls confirm that most Israelis initially favored the Oslo peace process, but soured on the land for peace deal after a series of Palestinian terrorist attacks starting in 1994. The fence thus gained popularity as a unilateral countermeasure in the apparent absence of a trustworthy bargaining partner. Understandably, the Palestinians I spoke to had a very different take on the wall, as they call it. They told me how the wall shatters their dreams of a state. One day, from the back of a cab in Ramallah, I read an article from the flagship journal in political science that I had printed out the night before. In the strategic logic of suicide terrorism, Robert Pate contends that militant leaders adopt terrorism 
because they've learned that it's the best method for pressuring government concessions. As proof that terrorism pays, he pointed to Israeli territorial concessions to the Palestinians. But he said that 9-11 and other terrorist campaigns follow the same strategic logic. I was immediately struck by the disconnect between what I was reading and seeing on the ground. The Palestinians I met sure didn't seem like political winners. I couldn't help but wonder, if the Palestinians are the big political success story, then how have other groups fared that also use terrorism? Naturally, I began to reconsider whether 9-11 worked. Bin Laden said the point of 9-11 was to redress four grievances. For the U.S. to withdraw from the Persian Gulf, to stop supporting military interventions that kill Muslims around the world, to sever relations with what he called apostate regimes, especially Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, and to destroy the special relationship with Israel. I couldn't help but notice, though, that on all four scores, the attack backfired. The U.S. increased its troop presence in the Persian Gulf by a factor of 15. The U.S. killed thousands of Muslims around the world as part of the war on terrorism, especially in Afghanistan and Iraq. The U.S. strengthened relations with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan to counter the terrorism threat. And U.S.-Israeli relations under Sharon and Bush soared to unprecedented heights. Jihadists themselves, from al-Suri to al-Masri, share my assessment that, from a strategic perspective, 9-11 was a fiasco. Now, we need to be careful about cherry-picking, because with so many militant groups in the world, there's bound to be a case or two to support just about any theory. In addition to publishing the first case studies ever done on the political ineffectiveness of terrorism, I've published the first large-end studies showing that terrorist attacks, especially against civilians, doesn't pay. In a 2006 study in international security called Why Terrorism Does Not Work, I showed that, ironically, foreign terrorist organizations have almost always achieved their political demands when they directed their violence against military targets, not civilians. Take a look at the political success rate, depending on the campaign's target selection. You can see that political successes happen when rebels direct their violence against military targets, not civilians. You may wonder whether this relationship between terrorism and political failure is just correlated rather than causal. What my regression analyses show is that even after controlling for all sorts of other factors, like the capability of the group and the nature of its demands, terrorist attacks against civilians significantly lower the odds of government concessions. This is true, I find, even in hostage settings. Killing even just one civilian hostage lowers the likelihood by 7% of the hostage takers obtaining any of their demands. I've even gotten complimentary results in controlled survey experiments where I find that members of the public are significantly less interested in making concessions to groups when they're believed to have used terrorism. Now, an interesting question is why so many people seem to think terrorism pays, given its terrible political track record. I've coined the term terrorist lumpers to describe those who see every attack carried out by a militant group as terrorism. This conceptual murkiness leads people to conclude that terrorism pays, even when the violence wasn't against civilians. When scholars say that terrorism worked, they almost always point to the Urgun success in pressuring the Brits from Palestine, or the ANC's success in forcing South Africa to end the apartheid, or Hezbollah's success in driving Israel and the U.S. out of southern Lebanon. Even though these campaigns were directed against government forces and not their civilians. Like scholars, many militant leaders also seem to overrate the political value of terrorism due to lumping. I did a content analysis of Osama bin Laden's statements in the run-up to the 9-11 terrorist attacks to see which asymmetric campaigns he described as political successes for him to emulate. All 65 campaigns invoked are guerrilla, not terrorists, in the sense that they were directed against government forces and not 
they're civilians. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, okay, but what about groups that only care about their own survival and not about achieving their stated political goals? Well, even if we treat organizational survival rather than concessions as the dependent variable, terrorism is still a losing tactic. That's because terrorism reduces human capital, the backbone of all organizations. Within sociology, organizational ecologists have found that the key determinant of groups dying out is the so-called liability of smallness. The fewer the members of a group, the greater the chances it won't survive. I find that when militant groups attack civilians, governments are over twice as likely to use repression against the group and over four times as likely to use violence against the group. So not only does attacking civilians result in the deaths of organization members, but the dangers of participation dissuade many prospective members from ever joining. Furthermore, the moral repugnance of killing civilians erodes local and international support, essential for both political and organizational success. Just ask members of the Patriot Movement what happened to their support after the McVeigh attack or IRA supporters after Pier of Lupa shopping center in the 90s, or Egyptian Islamists after the Luxor massacre, or the GIA after destroying Algeria, or AQI after massacre in Iraq. Most political scientists will tell you that militant groups turn to terrorism because they're weak. What I find, though, is that weaker groups are actually no more likely to use terrorism. A much better predictor of terrorism is whether the leader tells his members to attack civilians. I find that militant groups are over 50 times more likely to engage in terrorism when the leader tells its members to attack civilians. Boko Haram, ISIS, and other savage groups, they've been leading perpetrators of terrorism not because they're somehow weak, but because the members were following orders. Luckily, many militant leaders like of Algerian groups and of Palestinian groups and even Al-Qaeda Central admit that they've learned over time the perils of attacking civilians. We can observe this learning process indirectly by the negative statistical relationship between the age of militant groups and their propensity to attack civilians. Over time, I find that militant groups become more bloodshot as the leader learns it doesn't pay. Of course, the targeting choices of militant groups aren't a perfect reflection of the leader's preferences. Even when the leader has learned the costs of terrorism, he must still prevent his fighters from doing it, which brings us to rule number two. For many reasons, it's hard for leaders to prevent their fighters from attacking civilians. Lower level members of the group tend to be less educated, so they're even less likely than the leader to have read about the dangers of civilian attacks. And lower level members tend to be younger, so they're also less likely to have learned this lesson firsthand. Many militants, they don't even know about or care about the political platform of the group. Instead, they may participate for the social solidarity, the camaraderie, the sense of adventure, or just out of boredom. On top of all that, lower level members have stronger personal incentives for harming civilians. Like in gangs, they sometimes commit violence to gain stature among their peers, whereas the senior leadership is already at the organizational apex. To cultivate task cohesion, as it's known in management, smart militant leaders centralize the organization so they can educate fighters to avoid civilians, punish fighters who harm civilians, and screen out prospective members who seem prone to attacking <coughs> civilians. This chart depicts the predicted probabilities of which militant groups will attack civilians. When the leader is smart enough to oppose terrorism and centralize the group, his members attack civilians only 15% of the time. This might seem like a high likelihood of terrorism, until you consider it's about half as likely as when the leader tells members in a decentralized group not to do it. Of course, it's also much, much lower than when the leader tells its members to attack civilians. 
Groups are basically guaranteed to attack civilians when the leader favors this practice and decentralizes the group, leaving tactical discretion up to the rank and file. Similarly, I find that the further fighters mount operations away from the leader, the greater the chances that they'll attack civilians. Operatives are about twice as likely to engage in terrorism when they engage in international violence and cross-border insurgency. If my theory is correct, you'd also expect members of affiliates to be even more prone to terrorism than in the parent group because they're even more decentralized from the senior leadership. This is a network analysis of the relationship between terrorist groups and their affiliates. Affiliates are about 14% more likely to commit terrorism, and this number continues to rise as the distance from the parent group grows. But to really appreciate the role of the leader, take a look at what happens when drones are shot at him and lower level members are calling the shots. As drones rain down on the leader, it forces him to assume a lower profile in the group, empowering lower level members to harm civilians. And when he gets struck, when he gets killed, the violence becomes even more indiscriminate, with attacks on military targets going down and attacks on civilian targets going up by about 40%. Interestingly, zookeepers have noticed a similar effect in African elephants. When the bull elephant is removed from the herd, juveniles are prone to lash out in indiscriminate rampages. And we see a similar phenomenon when a kingpin strategy is used against drug cartels. Of course, not all leaders matter equally in militant groups. Decapitation strikes are most likely to increase terrorism when the leader had opposed terrorism and centralized the group because his replacements can't be expected to share his targeting preferences and structure the group accordingly. As we've seen, there's only one kind of group that invariably commits terrorism, where the leader supports terrorism in a decentralized group. This is the only kind of group where taking out the leader won't increase the, that amount of terrorism. Such leaders, they never understood the dangers of civilian attacks, nor built the organization to limit them. This kind of leader is so incompetent that his death has no impact whatsoever on the group's performance. An example is Baghdadi. Many people have wanted him dead, but it wouldn't have changed the tactical choices of the group because he never learned the costs of civilian attacks nor structured the organization to restrain them. Baghdadi, as you'll see, violated the third and final rule as well. Even in the best run groups, some militants will still occasionally attack civilians due to ignorance, personal incentives, or just bad luck. As we've seen, civilians are still struck about 15% of the time, even when the leader was smart enough to oppose terrorism and centralize the group to limit it. This means that almost all militant leaders will at some point face a PR disaster when civilians have been killed. What the leader should do then is brand the organization as moderate, even when his members act otherwise. In practice, this means denying the terrorist attack. There's a scientific literature within communication studies on what's called image restoration. Dozens of experiments since the 1970s have found that denying the wrongdoing can lessen perceptions of culpability. For example, in one study, subjects were told that someone was immoral. In the treatment condition, he denied the charges, reducing confidence in the allegations against him. Successful militant leaders also engage in what I call denial of organizational involvement, or DOI. When members of the Animal Liberation Front or Hezbollah kill civilians, the leaders simply deny organizational responsibility. Even the leaders of some rather extreme groups like the Taliban reluctantly claim civilian attacks. I've analyzed the credit claiming rates of every militant group in the world, according to the Global Terrorism Database. And even after controlling for about a dozen factors, an attack against a civilian target reduces the odds of the leader claiming credit by 41%. And as the group gets older, as it matures, 
in the leader gains experience, he becomes even less likely to claim civilian attacks. Of course, some leaders like Sarkawi and Baghdadi never learned the value of moderate branding. Their groups claimed all of the carnage, uniting the world against them. Denial of organizational involvement isn't always a realistic option, though. Sometimes groups are caught red-handed. What smart militant leaders do then isn't DOI, but what I call DPI, or denial of principal intent. With DPI, the leader acknowledges that his members committed the attack, but denies it reflects the mission of the group. Luckily for rebels, there's a science to DPI as with DOI. Social psychologists have identified several accounts for people to restore their image when an offense has undeniably been committed. The most well-known account strategy is an apology, which is an expression of remorse. Another standard account is to pin the blame on others by scapegoating them. Taking corrective action is another signal of goodwill, such as by publicly punishing the transgressors. Justification lessens the reputational fallout by redefining the offense as less severe than it might seem. And a final account strategy is known as bolstering, where the offender tries to refocus attention away from the misconduct to more popular behaviors. These accounts may seem really cheesy, but experiments show that they work at image restoration, and that's why business executives practice them all the time. For example, in 2003, Cadbury stared down its own PR crisis when several of its chocolate bars in Mumbai got infested with worms. At first, the CEO denied the charges, but as more cases surfaced, he issued an apology, he blamed the worms on poor storage at retail stores, he developed worm-proof packaging. He justified the mishap by noting that just a minuscule portion of chocolate bars were infected. And he bolstered the company's reputation by pointing to its job creation. Smart militant leaders also employ these accounts. When organizational culpability is undeniable, the leaders of the ANC, Al-Aqsa Martyr Brigades, IRA, even Nusra and the Taliban, they say, we're sorry civilians were harmed. They blame the attacks on rogue operatives. They publicly punish them, and they try to show that the group commits less carnage than you might think. This final chart compares the target selection of militant groups to the attacks featured in their propaganda videos. Even some very radical groups like Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and Al-Shabaab feature in their videos significantly less civilian violence than what their members actually carry out. By contrast, the leaders of super, super extreme groups like AQI and ISIS, they do the opposite. By not only claiming credit for all of the carnage, but then boasting about it over social media, which mobilized the world to pummel them. The, the conventional wisdom has been that the key to combating ISIS is to shut down its violent accounts on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. But Twitter and Facebook should be thanked, not condemned, for exposing the group's evil face and thereby ensuring the demise of the California.